Great. Welcome all to this first seminar in the Climate Perspective seminar series. Uh, my name is Camilla Munkadal. I'm an undergraduate student here at SOAS, and I've been organizing this seminar series with an amazing group of people from across years, courses, and societies at SOAS. Um, we are all extremely excited to be able to finally open this uh, seminar series, which we've been working on for a while now, um, and we're very happy to see such a big audience tonight. <clears throat> the seminar will be followed by a reception in SG 37. Um, we're going to write a small notice just to let you know how to get down there, but it's on the ground floor uh, next to the, as you're overlooking the atrium, it's just to the right. It's the big study area there is, uh, with some vegetarian nibbles and some drinks, um, and we hope that many of you can stay for that. At this point in time, I personally find it very hard to be optimistic about the prospects for political action on climate change. There are so many ideas, so many movements, and so many political means for drastically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we are still heading towards a three to four degrees rise in global average temperatures. What's lacking, of course, is the political will from the people in power. Such, uh, and such will, of course, only comes uh, from the sense of urgency that I'm sure that everyone in this room feels when it comes to climate change. Such a sense of urgency needs to spread as fast as possible among as many people as possible um, in order to prevent the devastating consequences that scientists have been warning us about for decades. An important part of this process is to promote the understanding that climate change must be understood and acted upon by all sectors and all agents in society. Based on this belief, the Climate Perspective Seminar Series will address climate change from the perspectives of politics, dev development, law, economics, and individual action, as comprehensively and as objectively as possible. Our speakers are all experts on climate change within their field, and they come from a diverse range of backgrounds. But one view that will prevail throughout the series is that climate change is inherently linked to unequal power relations. On a global and local scale, and that the inequalities must be addressed in the process of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Each seminar will bring its own perspective on how this can be achieved, and each seminar will attempt to convey climate issues that are given less attention in the media. And through this approach, we hope that the series will manage to give you, the audience, a new perspective on climate change. If you want to tweet about the seminar, you can uh, use the hashtag climate perspectives. Um, the, we will have a 40-minute talk, and then we're going to open the floor to questions um, and discussion afterwards. And now it is my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Larry Lohman. Le <laughs> Um, Larry is a climate researcher specializing in the global inequalities connected with climate change. For years he has worked with movements engaged with social and environmental justice issues in relation to climate change, in relation to climate change, rights of indigenous people, and conservation. This includes, but is not limited to, the World Rainforest Movement, which promotes the rights of forest-dependent communities, as well as the Durban Group for Climate Justice, a network of grassroots movements, mobilizing communities around the world to take action on climate change. Larry has previously been a visiting fellow in the Yale <coughs> University program in agrarian studies, and he has also worked with Thailand's project for ecological recovery. Larry currently works for the Corner House, an institute carrying out research and advocacy on climate change and on issues re relating to social and environmental justice. Larry has brought with him some free books and papers that you are free to take a look at and take with you after the seminar. Larry fits perfectly into the setting of SOAS as he speaks fluent Thai. He also fits perfectly into the in Climate Perspective Seminar Series, as his current work at the Corner House has the aim of, quote, linking issues of stimulating informed discussion and strategic thought on critical environmental and social concerns, and of encouraging broad alliances to tackle them. Although we cannot measure ourselves against an organization like the Corner House, the objective of this series is the same to link issues, to stimulate informed discussion, and to encourage broad alliances to tackle environmental and social concerns. It is therefore an honor for me to present to you tonight our first speaker in the Climate Perspective Seminar Series, Larry Lohman. Thanks, Camilla. 
Thanks very much, Camilla. Um, Camilla's introduced me, so I suppose I should introduce my pussy hat. You, you know what this, you all know what this is, don't you? The, the very beautiful pussy hat made by my uh, dear artist friend, Solveig Goethe, sitting in the back there. It's seven different shades of pink on it, if you can believe that. Um, but I suppose your question is, why am I wearing a pussy hat at a talk about climate? And that's the, that's the question I'm going to try to talk about. I won't get around to answering it, probably, but I do want to address myself to that, to that set of issues. I suppose one reason why it's puzzling why, why I'm wearing a pussy hat is that we tend to think of climate in terms of greenhouse gases and of as Camilla said, limiting the amount of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. So we think, tend to think of it in terms of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, CO2 equivalents, and also energy. Everybody knows that energy is very important in climate change. Uh, so we have this whole cluster of somewhat reified, somewhat fetishized objects, which we always think about when we talk about climate change. And of course, the biggest one of those objects is climate itself, which has been sort of constructed as this discrete and observable object out there, which is somehow something separate from society, which somehow society has to manage or, or do something with. And of course, it's in the nature of all of these objects that there's a lot of numbers involved. We've all heard the numbers about climate change, two degrees, four degrees, Camilla just mentioned. Uh, 350 parts per million. Some years ago, Bill McKibben, uh, when we were waiting to, to go on the Amy Goodman show together, he presented me with a, with a 350 necktie. With the, I, I've lost it for some reason. I wish I could show it to you, but it had, it had the numbers 350 emblazoned down the, down the <coughs> necktie. Um, and I think that's, 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 that's very significant. I mean, this is, you know, we're, with Bill McKibben's movement, 350.org, we're, you know, we're dealing with a social movement which doesn't have a slogan like, you know, land and bread or bread and roses or anything like that. It's like 350. 350 is a slogan. And I think that that's very significant and something that we, we do have to think about. Um, so in a sense, I guess what I'm going to be talking about today is, is, a, is a fashion contrast between my own pussy hat and, and Bill McKibben's uh, 350.org tie. I mean, I have, great, I have great respect for Bill McKibben, actually, and I, I think that he, like me, is on a journey toward overcoming some of our own limitations in dealing with, with uh, issues like climate change, especially as Westerners, especially as white Western men. So um, I think we're, we're in this together, in a sense. In addition to things like carbon dioxide and the climate system and all of these other strange objects, there's also these fetishized processes which we've grown accustomed to hearing about when we talk about climate, like adaptation and negation. You know, there's this strange dichotomy people present us with. Okay, are you, do you, are you for adaptation or are you for mitigation? Do you think mitigation is more important or should we concentrate on adaptation? And this sort of defines the horizon, the, the horizon of, of, of discussion in many cases. And this horizon is indirectly um, um, limited by these fetishized objects I talked about, the carbon dioxide and so forth. Because the adaptation and mitigation are concepts which are organized around these objects, like carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide equivalents and so forth. Then we have energy popping up in the, in the, you know, the movement for renewable energy. Uh, Fairly unquestioned, a fairly reified, fetishized object. You know, you don't. And your energy is just a given. It's just something that's out there. Energy poverty, energy democracy, and so forth. If this is what we mean by climate, then I think the overwhelming problem does become something like Camilla mentioned at the beginning. How do we connect these objects and processes to everyday political concerns? Or, or any political concerns, either, either inside or outside the mainstream. As Camilla said, you know, well, the problem becomes, how do we get the political will to 
to deal with these objects. She didn't put it in those terms exactly, but, but that, was sort of, that was sort of the framework. Um, so I think this is a very significant fact, that if we do confine ourselves to meaning this kind of thing by the word climate, then we're faced with this overwhelming and, and as Camilla said, very discouraging political problem. How do we connect? How do we connect with guys like Trump, for God's sake? I mean, it just doesn't seem possible. My position would be a little bit different. I mean, my position would be that if we're really seeking ways of connecting, then perhaps a non-random and more strategic way of going about it is, is to ask how climate ever became disconnected from these concerns in the first place. In other words, to engage in a little bit of historical political study. In other words, to extend our efforts at political organizing and movement building as well to encompass ways of reorganizing the ways we talk and think about climate, energy, fire, etc. themselves. And here I actually I'd like to refer to a controversy that I understand has been going on at SOAS itself. I think this is from The Guardian a couple of days ago. Uh, the uh, campaign to decolonize our minds. And The Guardian had this very nice article about our, our SOAS students' right to decolonize their minds from Western philosophers. And of course, this campaign to decolonize our minds at SOAS has uh, just driven the, the right-wing press completely nuts. I mean, the, the Daily Telegraph and the Times and the Daily Mail are just, what are you talking about? Are you throwing out these great classics of, of uh, you know, Western philosophy and literature and Plato and, and Hume and, and, and Mill and all these? I mean, you're just, you know, the Daily Mail had a headline, something like, uh, you can't be serious, K-A-N-T. <laughs> um, so that, that's the kind of, kind of the tone, and I think that extends to a lot of, a lot of the media when they're reporting on the, the, the campaign at SOAS. And of course, as I understand it, the campaign has nothing, has nothing to do with throwing out Plato and, and ignoring uh, John Stuart Mill and, and John Locke and all of these people. On the contrary, as I understand it, it represents a determination to study these figures even more deeply by looking at their place in their society and particularly their place in the colonialist society and how that works and then distancing them by introducing other thinkers from other traditions especially non-western traditions to put a little perspective on these on these on these great classics i don't know if i've got it right or not but that's that's the way i'm that's the way I, I, I interpret the campaign. Of course, that's completely different from the way the Daily Mail looks at the issue, which is, oh, these, these people are calling John Locke a racist, and they're throwing him out and burning his books. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Um, what I'm trying to do today, actually, is, is something a little bit similar to that. I'm, I'm trying to recount some stories from my own journey, which has been a very difficult journey, to try to decolonize my own climate mind which I think is actually very important. In fact, I, if, I could, if I could single out one bit of climate politics, or one aspect of climate politics that I think is the most important thing to be doing in climate politics over the next few years, it's this. It's to decolonize our very concepts and our very practices surrounding things like climate, energy, carbon dioxide molecules, uh, mitigation, adaptation, all the rest of it. Of course, if the Daily Mail heard me saying that, they would go crazy again. They'd say, what are, you, what are you saying? You know, are you saying that there are no carbon dioxide molecules? Are you saying there's no such thing as energy? You know, are you saying that the concept of energy is racist? Are you going to throw all of this climate science out? I mean, are you nuts? You know, this is what the Daily Mail would, would think of me. And I'm thinking, as in, as in the SOAS discussion, I think the response has to be very, very nuanced and complex. Uh, in a sense, yes. I'm doing, I'll be doing what the Daily Mail accuses me, would accuse me of doing. I do think the concept of energy is anti-labor. The very practices of thermodynamic energy are anti-labor. I think the practices of defining climate, the way we've defined it in this fetishized way, is racist. I think it's also patriarchalist. So I'm guilty of all of those things which the Daily Mail will be only so happy, only too happy to accuse me of. But as with the SOAS debate, I think you have to go further and you have to say, is he throwing out climate science? Is he saying climate science is not true? 
Is he saying we shouldn't study climate science? Is he saying we shouldn't talk about these things, mitigation, adaptation, uh, energy, and so forth? Well, of course not. My suggestion, I think, as in the SOAS debate, is we have to study them more deeply <coughs> by taking a broader perspective, getting a little bit of distance on how these concepts and their political entailments have developed over the last three or four centuries, say. But especially over the last over the last fifty years or so, I would say. So that's the context I'm going to be trying and speaking it, uh, trying to speak to. Um, in my own case, I've been very, very lucky in getting a lot of help from a lot of friends and other people around the world. Um, on every, on most continents, I think, in helping me understand a little bit of this broader perspective, so that so that I can begin to decolonize my climate mind. And just to give you a taste of this, I'm just going to show a few pictures. These are um, uh, people from the Karin Bagakayo uh, um, ethnic group in Thailand. A few years ago, you know, they were carrying around. Um, Banners like this in protest at the United Nations. The United Nations and the United Nations climate apparatus approached the climate. They were quite incensed, uh, as were a lot of other Thai people from different ethnic groups, about the whole concept of climate as it was being pursued in terms of carbon molecules and so forth at uh, the climate negotiations, which were at Bangkok that year. There's a satire on the clean development mechanism, which is one part of the Kyoto Protocol, carbon destroy movement. So to carbon trading, protesting, and at the same protest, you know, a protest against coal-fired electricity plants. That plant was defeated by the people, by the way. This is another group of uh, Thai people from southern Thailand. Um, and they were faced with their old nemesis, the state, trying to throw them off of state-owned forest reserve land, to which they didn't have full formal title. But the state had taken advantage of the whole climate discussion, and especially this, what I would call the colonialist climate discussion, and enlisted that as a new weapon in trying to evict these villagers from the state <laughs> forest land. The idea was that these villagers, oh, they've come in and they've cleared this beautiful forest and they're, you know, they're practicing agriculture on it and therefore they are causing global warming. And of course there was no shortage of scientific experts that the government could call on to uh, invent an entire sort of pseudo-scientific rationale for how the villagers were actually causing global warming and how much global warming they were causing. But I won't go into that. I just want to, I just want to quote the words of this lady here, Gam Jai Jai Kong, uh, from Patalung province, she said, I had to pay $50,000, this is in legal fines, for causing global warming, because I cut rubber trees on my own farmland that has come down to me from my ancestors over 200 years ago. I well understand the value of forests, but this is not forested land. Where am I going to get that kind of money? I've never even got my hands around as much as $300. Every day we keep coming back to the, the idea of killing ourselves. It's only out of concern for our children and grandchildren that we don't. Well, this was an uh, officer of the Santi Ban, the Thai secret police, who was taking a picture of, of demonstrators like those. He didn't, look very like, he didn't like very much my taking his picture, but you know, <laughs> I was a white Westerner. What could he do about it? Uganda. Okay, well, this explains it. The villagers stand amid corn planted on what the government says is national park, but which they claim has belonged to them for generations. To plant the corn, the villagers chopped down trees, and they were uh, monoculture eucalyptus trees planted by the a Dutch foundation as part of a carbon trading project to compensate for Dutch electricity uh, plant carbon dioxide emissions. There's some uh, um, campaigners against another forest carbon compensation program called RED, which many of you probably know about. Uh, this is a village I just visited last November, um, where again the, the, the villagers are being called upon to solve global warming by, or to help solve global warming 
by participating in some kind of forest conservation project on their land. And you know, we were, they didn't really understand you know, where this was coming from exactly, um, but they were very clear about, about one thing, which was that the people who were promoting the project, which in the background there was the World Bank, but in the foreground there, was, there were national park officials who hoped eventually to get some sort of financial compensation for participating in this kind of, this kind of carbon trading program. Uh, and they were unanimous in just saying, well, you know, these people don't understand our village. They don't understand what's going on here. You know, they, they come in with this idea of carbon, which we don't know, you know, we don't know what it is. And, then, and, and they, kept, they kept quoting this legal document that says, okay, you know, um, uh, pre-prior prior informed consent. You no know, legal safeguards, safeguards, safeguards. They kept repeating it. What is? Could you tell us what these safeguards mean? Because they, they they kept hearing this word, but no one had ever actually explained it to them. This is from the uh, Iwantepec, um Isthmus in Mexico, where there's a wind farm, supposedly renewable energy, taking over people's land. And again, the concept of climate which these people, like everybody else, I mean, they're, they're very well aware of what the, there's climate issues out there. The concept of climate is something which is contested in, in, in their discourse and in their minds. Uh, shift the scene to Ecuador. This is, a, this is a wonderful group of young people called the Yasunidos, who collected something like three quarters of uh, a million signatures in Ecuador alone, which is a very small country to try to stop the oil exploitation in the Yasuni National Park, which maybe some of you, some of you have heard of. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, quite a few people. Um, and they called themselves the Yasunidos. And their, their campaign was against, not only against oil exploitation, but for post-petroleum civilization, which they're working very hard with indigenous peoples and peasants and so forth to try to develop in Ecuador, or to try to elaborate in Ecuador. And on the occasion of the, the COP20 in Lima, Peru, they, they all got into a bus um, to sort of uh, do a protest expedition across the border to, to Peru, to Lima. And their slogan that appears on the, on the top of the bus is, we, you know, we, we are the, uh, uh, yeah, we're, 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 uh, we're not the adaptables. We don't adapt to climate, we don't adapt to climate change. And I think not many academics would actually listen carefully to what these young people were saying. But if you listen to them long enough, you realize that there's quite a detailed critique of this whole dichotomy of mitigation adaptation in their, in their discourse and even in their slogan. These young people, after all, are young people who are protesting against mitigation as well. They not only say, don't make us be adaptable, but don't mitigate us either. They're actually contesting the whole framework of climate discourse that all of us, most of us here, <coughs> take for granted. And predictably, their bus was stopped by police at the border, and they were refused entry to um, Peru. So let no one think that these questions which people like the Yasuniros are raising about the mainstream climate concepts are some kind of postmodern word game. The police who stop the bus and their bosses know very well it's not a word game. This is at the very heart of, of climate issues. Moving along to, to people who are looking at the subject from a historical perspective, um, this is my friend Andreas Malm, who was here a few week, couple of weeks ago, I think. Did everybody go to his 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 lecture? Yeah, I've learned I've learned a lot from from Andreas about also about decolonizing my idea of what energy is and also what, what climate and climate change are. As, as the people who are at that lecture probably, probably know or who, who have read Andreas's work, um, he goes back to what he calls the, the origin years of climate change when fossil fuels became, started to become so entrenched in society. And his point is, not, is that, uh, you know, that this... Um, this turn to fossil fuels did not come from some abstract need for energy, which people had been feeling since ancient days, and so suddenly they found a, you know, a way of providing this lack, this energy they needed. No, uh, 
steam energy and coal-fired coal -fired energy were developed as a way of both disciplining labor and as a way of increasing the productivity of labor. And that's what it was about at the beginning. And that's what it continues to be about today. Coal and oil are about increasing the productivity of paid labor so that surplus can be extracted from them so that capital can be accumulated. So anybody who talks about fossil fuel and defossilizing everything, they don't take account of what Andreas is saying. They're not really dealing with the climate issue. So again, a, a, a decolonizing kind of uh, perspective on climate change. Um, if you want a short course on some of this stuff, all you have to do actually is open your wallet and look at the and look at the bills inside. I mean, the, the British Treasury has been very obliging in this respect. Um, not only do we have Adam Smith here in the twenty pound note telling us about the division of labor and the great increase in the quantity of work that results. But if, we, if we're lucky enough to have a 50-pound note in our wallets, we can look at the back and we see our friend James Watt, the inventor of one of the improved steam engines, along, along with one of his business, business partners. And as usual with British currency, the quotations are very revealing. I sell here, sir, what all the world desires to have. Power! <laughs> what? I can think of nothing else but this machine. Right, okay, well, what machine are they talking about? They're talking about the, the steam engine, of course. And this is a sort of simplified, idealized diagram of the steam engine. Does anybody know what W is? Work. Work. No accident. The steam engine was for work. The concept as it developed in physics became a little bit distinct, but at the beginning it was all about labor, exploiting labor, getting the surplus out of labor. And in fact, the, the energy that we think of today, which is a rather recent concept, the energy of the thermodynamicists was above all the theory of steam engines. Steam engines were for increasing the productivity of labor, thermodynamics was the theory of steam engines. Turbine dynamics has the same origin as the desire of capital to beat laborers at, the certain, at a certain period of history. In fact, before 1800, no one talked about energy. Energy was not a part of nature. But by 1870, that had changed. Before 1800, this is a historian, a US historian, the equivalence of heat and mechanical energy was not suspected. This is one of the big concepts of thermodynamics. Heat and mechanical energy can be interconverted, so you can, you know, make electricity out of heat, and you can, uh, you know, change mechanics and so forth. Um, that was not suspected by people in the 18th century. The no notion that a horse pulling a treadmill and a coal fire heating a lime kiln were, in the some sense, doing the same thing, would have appeared absurd to them. But of course, today we have this omnibus, abstract concept of energy. This is from one of WWF's publications. Where you have you know terawatt hours being supplyable by different continents, you know, extremely aggregated kind of, of energy concept. And again, we have to ask ourselves: Is energy really the innocent concept that we've all assumed that it is, or does it have a certain background that we need to understand, a historical background, a historical development that we need to understand? Just as the thoughts of John Locke or Immanuel Kant have a certain background, which we need to understand if we're going to decolonize our, our treatment of them. <coughs> Other historian, Theodore Porter, an economic point of view formed the root of thermodynamics, economic and physical ideas together, sharing a common context. George Kavensis, infinite multiplicity of energetic forms, inspired a tremendous optimism in capitalist search for new workforces. So, so what does this tell us about energy campaigning today and climate campaigning today? Well, we see a lot of, you know, we see a lot of Believe me, I'm not criticizing the Suez project about renewable energy, but you see a lot of slogans that, you know, okay, this will solve our climate problem. Renewable energy for all forever. I think from a decolonizing point of view, it's not going to be so simple if we look at the historical development and the, and the political context of this concept of energy. The energy is a problematic concept for popular democratic movements to use innocently. 
It's also problematic for post-petroleum movements to use because it assumes the normality of using something similar to fossil fuels in energy converters boosting the exploitation of labor. Daily Mail will get really upset with me. Oh, are you saying we should, we should throw out energy? You see, we, we can't use energy. We can't talk about energy. Of course not. That's not at all what I'm saying. Quite the contrary. I'm saying that we need to subject energy to a more a closer scrutiny and the practices surrounding energy to a closer scrutiny. Um, I wanted to talk about the history of fire a little bit, but I think I'll skip this bit. Yeah, just to mention that, you know, about how deeply, you know, how deeply these physical, uh, the, the, these physical concepts and these, these sort of standard concepts of, of fire and uh, so forth have permeated into our consciousness. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of remarkable fact once, once you talk to people who are have, trying to help decolonize your ideas of climate, heat, energy, and fire, that today fire in the open is criminalized usually. There's always big campaigns against, you know, don't burn the forest, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be burning your, your, your agricultural fields in order to, uh, you know, fix the ashes in the soil because this is not improving, this is not improve your agriculture, you students at SOAS will know the whole, the whole uh, discourse in, in agriculture in the 19th century and so forth. Uh, yeah, the imperialists were always saying, this is not an improving agriculture, this is not an, an agriculture which continues to uh, produce more and more stuff. It's, you know, it's sort of this steady state agriculture where you burn the fields every year and you get your fertilizer from that. How's that how is that going to progress anything? I mean, there's that whole, there's that whole sort of history in agriculture, and especially in colonial, colonial agriculture in, in Asia, which probably a lot of you know about. Anyway, that, this kind of fire is, tends to be very criminalized these days, whereas the fire inside <laughs> cars is never criminalized. In fact, we don't even notice it. We don't even think of it as fire. We don't look at a city street and see hundreds of fires, individual fires, inside each car and each truck. It's never. It's not the opposite of being criminalized. It's it's raised up as a, as an idea of, of progress and enlightenment. So no one calls this a city in flames. This is not a city in flames like Los Angeles. And similarly, this is not a this this is a normal picture where the. You call the firefighters to put out your fire, you know, your grass fire, your brush fire in the open. But you never call the firefighters to put out the fire in the cars and, you know, inside the combustion chambers. Or, of course, you don't call the firefighters to put out the fires in, in, in industry. Okay, um, how much time do I have? Oh, not too bad. Okay. Well, um, in, in the final part of part of my talk today, I just wanted to I wanted to build on what I've said so far to, to mention two responses to post 1970s capitalist crisis and why they are not alternatives to each other. And I think these two responses are actually very topical in 2017 because, in a sense, they're they're defining the horizon of a lot of the way we in Europe and North America and, and Japan and China think about, think about climate change. And I think this is another case where in order to understand today's environmental debate, you do have to try to decolonize your mind a little bit, go back in history, even if it's only to the 1970s, study Marx a little bit to, to try to link these things with energy, labor, and so forth, and, and soil and environment. And I think uh, this is just an example of what I've been trying to trying to urge on you is, is um, understanding this very topical divide between two responses to capitalist crisis, which we're seeing today in the climate debate, and look at that from a from a sort of um, um, a different perspective. Uh, the two the two responses are and I'm oversimplifying here, but the two responses are very roughly ecosystem services exchanges. Ecosystem service markets, ecosystem service transactions on the one side, and examples here the Kyoto Protocol with its carbon trading, Paris Agreement with its new improved carbon trading, the EU emissions trading system, and so forth, but also many other things which are outside the realm of climate, you know, biodiversity credits and species credit and all the rest of it. Um, so these are some of the units that have been invented since the 1970s. 
which are now being traded as a response to climate change and the capitalist, <coughs> capitalist crisis. On the other side, we have what, for convenience's sake, I'll simply refer to tonight as Trumpism. That's a nice short way of indicating a slightly different approach, uh, although it's not a new approach. There's nothing new about it. It didn't come into being with Trump. Trump is just an expression of something which has been around for quite a long time. It goes back, you know, well, well before the 1970s. Um, but I think these are very significant, significant sort of uh, um, positions which derive from the same history. I'm not saying that Trump is the same thing as the Kyoto Protocol, because Trump says he's against it. He's against the Paris Agreement. Yet what I'm trying to say is if we look at the, look at the climate debate from a more decolonized, decolonizing perspective, we can see that both Trumpism and the Paris Agreement are expressions of the same history, responses by different parts of capital to the same unfolding crisis. And of course, there's a big debate between those different, those different factions of capital, the different factions of environmentalism, if you want to call Trump an environmentalist. Uh, but um, I think this is something we need to understand if we're going to be supporting a decolonized climate movement, the fact that both of these colonizing climate movements come from the same history and to some degree the same perspective. And to understand what I'm trying to try to say here, I think we have to go back a little bit, a little bit into our marks. Uh, capital accumulation, classically conceived as the accumulation of abstract social labor, you're able to grow. You're able to do economic growth. But you can find a lot of laborers, put them to work, and then you can steal a little bit of their time and add it to your bank balance. They don't have any choice. They don't have any land anymore. And they don't have any other way of supporting themselves than by selling their labor, so you can exploit that. But of course, that, that relation between labor and capital, that actually presupposes something else that Marx talked about, which is uh, primitive accumulation or enclosure, where you, where you actually had to have a process. And this is a process which continues every day today in 2017 of, roughly speaking, dividing people from their land. How do you get laborers? You've got to divide them from their land, otherwise they're not going to work for you. How do you get resources? You've got to divide the land from the people, otherwise the people are going to be stopping you from using it as resources for your growth. So this is like a prerequisite, prerequisite of that relationship between capital and, and labor. And I would just add that um, uh, another way of looking at these things and the non-human aspects of this landscape, is as activities or even work which is being carried out not only by human beings but by non-human beings. So the thing is to take this work which is unpaid, these activities which are unpaid, which are conducted both by humans and non-humans, and convert them into, into something else, separate them, and make them, make them into something which can be used um, to get rich, accumulate capital. Um, and one aspect of this, of course, is as the 1970s feminists uh, were, were forever indebted to for pointing out, is that a lot of this unpaid labor was not only unpaid labor of water and of microorganisms, and so it's women also, unpaid reproductive labor from women. She says this, you know, this, this, was, this was the challenge facing capital five centuries ago in initiating the process of capitalist accumulation. It is still the problem today. For the continuation of this mode of production and its combined strategies of development and underdevelopment. So the picture is sort of like this. You have all of these, you have all of this sort of unpaid activity, devalued activity, because you know, we're not paying for it because it's not worth anything, of course. I mean, that's the capitalist mythology. Uh, and it's also to some extent invisibilized. I mean, it took the 1970s feminists to point it to make this stuff visible in terms of uh, reproductive work of women, and so forth. So you have all of this stuff, including, you know, thermodynamic energy, feeding into making possible um, the labor which capitalists use to uh, accumulate. So we got the, ins we, you know, the, 
factories are supported not only by the, the, the workers and the, and the mining and the resources, but also by the incessant in activities of non-human beings, as well as the unpaid activities of, of human beings, not only, not only women in the households and on the farm, but uh, you know, just everyday peasants who are doing a lot of, a lot of unpaid care for the earth. A uh, good example of this process in action is China between 2000 and 2010, roughly, where you had this huge uh, move of foreign investment into coastal China, southern China, to take advantage of the cheap labor which was being taken out of the countryside, moving to the cities. Huge. I mean, this is a you know un historically unprecedented pulse of sort of raw cheap labor, which could be paid initially at a very low rate in order to manufacture stuff for exports. But supporting that, and indispensable to that, was also another kind of activity, the activity of um, ancient you know, microorganisms that made coal, and the activity of taking that coal out of, the, out of the earth and using that to increase the productivity of all of this cheap labor. So you had the cheap labor and the, and the, cheap, uh, the cheap nature supporting it. So that, I mean, that's a very concrete example of it. And no, 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 notably, since, since 2010 or so, this, this model has been uh, faltering a bit because um, the, uh, the sort of energies and the flexibility of that very, very cheap labor is running out. They're demanding more pay. They're committing suicide. You know, the capitalists are thinking about, you know, moving to Vietnam and all of the rest of this stuff. Um, this is one way of sort of summar summarizing the same, the same picture is, your imperative as, as a capitalist is to increase the productivity of wage labor, to get more bang for your buck out of, out of the workers that you But for every increase, small increase in the productivity of wage labor, you need a whole lot of unpaid labor to support that, to make it possible. That includes, you know, not only your mining operations, your oil operations, but it includes, you know, includes a lot of different kinds of unpaid labor. And eventually, through this process, uh, you get a sort of progressive exhaustion or maxing out of these frontiers of unpaid activity, whether it's you know coal or whether it's uh, uh, labor itself or, or, or whatever. Uh, and this is not quite the same as what people talk about in the mainstream as resource depletion or peak oil. I mean, just as with a you know with the labor situation, you know what what capital is worried about when it thinks about oh, you know, labor is going to run. What, they're not worried about the workers having heart attacks on the assembly line and suddenly keeling over and they're not there. No, they're worried about something which is much more complex, involving processes of resistance, involving processes of, you know, laziness and foot dragging and, and uh, people just, you know, demanding more wages, all of this sort of stuff. I mean, it's not as simple as resource depletion. And that's true of labor, but it's also true of, uh, true of everything else. One nice emblematic example of, of sort of what's have been happening in the neoliberal age under this kind of dynamic is the, is the big blowout with the deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico uh, some years ago, uh, where, you know, the, of course they're looking for cheap oil, but, you know, the, the cheap oil does recede to these further frontiers. And in this sense, the sort of idea that resources are running out, there's, there's an element of truth in that. You know, they have to go farther and, and look harder for the oil. But also there's these imperatives for them to cut costs in doing so, because that the costs of that naturally rise and rise and rise. But you know, BP certainly tried to cut as many costs as it could in in um, in, in searching for that for that uh, horizon of unpaid work in the form of oil, and with the result that we all know. But something that that not as many people know is that to clean up what happened afterwards. And this is also a part of the capitalist process, the capitalist dynamic, to clean up the inevitable mess that happened. Um, BP, together with the state government of Louisiana and other actors, uh, had to look for cheap labor, the cheaper the possible. And in doing so, they, they overlooked all of the unemployed fishermen and so forth on the, on the coast of Louisiana. And they went straight to the prison system, which supplied them with not only low cost, but in some cases, no cost labor for cleaning up the enormous mess on the beaches of Louisiana, which was caused by the BP, BP blowout. And when people started asking questions about this, you know, the state authorities answered, well, um, gosh, um, this is part of their sentence. You know, these guys are criminals. 
part of their sentence is they work for you for free. <coughs> so did anybody say racism? Did anybody say, I mean, they're, mostly, they're almost all black. Um, you know, did anybody say slavery? Well, people don't usually use the word slavery, but this is actually, you know, and this is, you know, this is a, an example of a dynamic. You, get, you exhaust a frontier, maxed out, it's not flexible anymore, it's sclerotic. You've got to find a new frontier, and the frontier is going to be a frontier where, where the, you can get new kinds of cheap activity, which hasn't yet been capitalized. And this is, you know, anybody who thinks that this, this inmate labor is unrelated to the petroleum extraction, anybody who thinks that that dynamic is different between these two things, or that we're talking about two different subjects, I think just doesn't understand capitalism. So I want to expand a little bit on what I mean by this maxing out of this exhaustion of frontiers. And I think one manifestation of frontiers being exhausted is when people just can't take it anymore when their environment's being destroyed. And in the US, this happened in the 60s and 70s and resulted in this, this, this strange wave of, of environmental regulation which, which started up in the 1970s. Um, but almost as soon as this regulation was, was uh, promulgated, there started, you started hearing voices that, oh, but this is a growth ban. You know, we can't accumulate capital uh, if this regulation is really, hol really holding. And this became quite a strong current, uh, certainly as early as the Jimmy Carter administration. So the idea that this, you know, this would disrupt this whole, this whole um, dynamic. And this remains the concern behind both the Paris Agreement and Trumpist anti-Paris sentiment. The problem is that the frontiers are becoming exhausted and sclerotic. In order to do something about that, we institute environmental regulation, but it costs too much. The Paris Agreement deals with that, in a way I'll try to explain a little bit more, through ecosystem services trading. Trump deals with that by saying, well, let's just forget it. I mean, let's, let's forget about this regulation nonsense. I mean, let's not modify it. Let's just forget it. So just a few more details about the ecosystem service trading response, which includes the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol and so forth. This, the idea here is to repair this pipeline of unpaid work so that the unpaid work can continue to flow. So you admit that you know, this is becoming sclerotic or inflexible or exhausted, but you, know, you repair the pipeline. How do you do that? Well, you try to make the regulation more legislation more, more, more flexible, and you try to import units of environmental services from somewhere else in the world or from the future in order to repair your frontier. So the frontier can continue to provide this unpaid work to the capitalist system, which will ensure the productivity of labor. This is very, and this is very frank, sorry? And this is very frankly admitted by you know, uh, the, the, uh, and the ecosystem services traders themselves. They said the objective is to transform environmental regulation into tradable instruments. So to transform the law into, into commodities. So we have some of these, these commodities. And of course they're traded worldwide in the form of, of uh, legal rights to be more or less exempt from certain kinds of regulation, which have been modified to allow for that institutional responses to the threat to accumulation. But of course, the same dynamic erupts here. You're f taking these ecosystem services from different parts of the, of the globe, but in order to do that, you have to modify these ecosystem services. You have to, you have to modify what's going on in the unpaid work uh, of nature and of, of, of non-humans. And that begins to have a toll. That begins to take a toll. For example, if you have a carbon trading program which, uh, which tries to extract uh, carbon emission rights from, uh, from an agroforestry system or from a, from a forest, you know, naturally you're going to be concentrating on the aspect of that nature, that forest or that agricultural field, which can provide low-cost tokens of environmental regulatory relief. And that's going to have a certain toll on that particular kind of nature. Okay, just briefly, a second form of magical thinking, because that was a form of magical thinking, is Trumpism. And Trumpist fantasy holds that rather than being a symptom of the decline in the usability of old frontiers, regulation is actually the cause. And if you get rid of regulation, 
you'll just solve all your problems. We can go back to using the old frontiers just like before. So you oppress immigrants through threats of expulsion or exclusion, and they will quietly go right back to providing previous levels of low-cost and no-cost labor. Get rid of environmental regulation and all of the previously costless activity of organisms in the old waste dumps on land and the sea and elsewhere uh, will instantly return to effective service in the cause of capital. No repairs of the frontier are actually necessary. Abolish welfare programs and other old reservoirs of free work can once again be tapped without capitals having to pay increasing costs for their maintenance. Criminalize blacks and Mexican Americans and non-white environmental protesters. That's very important in places like the Andes and Latin America. And you can use their labor for free as prison inmates. Oppress women anew and they will immediately go back to providing unpaid reproductive work in support of a white male labor aristocracy. Well, it ain't going to happen, but this is, this is the message that Trump is trying to, to get across, and a lot, of, a lot of capitalists would love to believe that it's true. And we'll see what happens next. Anyway, so this is, this is, this is where I'll stop. Um, and for me, one of the political um, conclusions from all of this is, just as Obamaism should never be seen as the alternative to Trumpism, they come from the same history, and the EU should not be seen as the alternative to Nigel Farage, nor, in this I'm making reference to Ecuadorian politics, Lenin Moreno should not be the alternative to Lasso and the rule of the bankers. So too, the Paris Agreement should never be presented as the alternative to Trumpism. That way lies divide and rule and strategic defeat. Again, I think the value of trying to decolonize our climate minds, as, as the rest of our minds, is in strategy and in political wisdom and in a uh, way of movement building in the future around climate as well as, as other issues.